Okay, so this is the final component uh, on water harvesting and water use technologies in uh, ancient pre-colonial India, where I would now enter into uh, debates and discussion. So, how the different schools of thought or rather how through their long term researches, historians, environmental historians, water historians, they are uh, trying to you know engage into a debate that whether everything or all the water harvesting mechanisms or schemes that were prevalent in colonial uh, pre colonial India, whether all of it was really you know extremely good and beneficial and had no negative repercussions or implications for ecology and society. So, this is the debate all about like uh, pre colonial equilibrium versus uh, colonial hydrology. So, I will explain it right now. So, uh, I mean there is a particular understanding that during the pre colonial period there was a metabolic relationship a metabolism between river and society right. So, uh, I mean and there is an argument that uh, during the colonial period this metabolism it actually changed into a metabolic rift again to use a kind of a, a Marxian term. So, the metabolic rift is a Marxian concept which had been popularized by John Bellamy Foster in his book on Marx, uh, Marx's ecology and uh, on his you know uh, numerous writings uh, on environmental sociology and also uh, environmental social sciences. Uh, so, there is a understanding that uh, the pre-colonial period so far as water harvesting uh, uh, mechanisms or techniques are concerned, it was an environmentally benign period and it was absolutely socially accommodative. Okay. So, there was an equilibrium between water and society during the pre colonial period, this is the argument. And we will see that how you know uh, this uh, argument has been validated by numerous examples across different parts of the country. So, this is one argument on the one hand and there is uh, I mean uh, the binary argument is that uh, so the pre colonial period as there was equilibrium between river society relationship or there was equilibrium in the river society uh, relationship during the colonial period this equilibrium it got transformed or the metabolism it was transformed into metabolic rift or disruption. So, while pre colonial period was environmentally benign, colonial period was environmentally malign. So, while pre colonial period was socially accommodative, colonial period was socially disruptive. So, this is an argument that uh, you know comes up across uh, comes across the works of uh, various historians where they try to validate this framework uh, by citing numerous examples across different parts of the country. So, now let us go to those examples. Yeah. So, starting with Rohan Dizosa, the book that I uh, talked about, Downed and Drowned and Damned, published in 2006. An immensely influential book on the Orissa, on Orissa, on the Mahanadi Delta. So, uh, he talks about the uh, you know water uh, harvesting and water management practices in Orissa across a long term historical scale from the pre colonial to the colonial and also a little bit of the post colonial times when finally, the Hirakud dam was constructed on the Mahanadi river. So, Rohan Dissosa shows that and argues that how um, Orissa or how the Mahanadi delta it uh, I mean uh, uh, was a uh, escape where the farmers absolutely you know depended on flood for agriculture. So, he says that the pre colonial period was a flood dependent agrarian region. So, this is his argument in this particular book on focusing on Orissa. So, he says that as I mentioned uh, in my earlier lecture that flood was not at all looked into as a curse, it was looked as a boon or a blessing. So, it was understood by the farmers that flood was an absolute necessity for agriculture, because once flood water would recede, then the soil would be left with very fertile alluvium soil. So, how they used to tackle flood? So, they were very clear about the seasonal pattern or the seasonal flow of the river. 
and what I mean they had developed very interesting and innovative agricultural practices which was absolutely in tune to the mood of the river. So, they you know developed diverse production choices. So, uh, you know uh, if we uh, think about the different varieties of uh, paddy cultivation in Orissa uh, which was prevalent during the uh, pre-colonial times we uh, you know uh, we get to know about at least uh, three varieties of uh, rice. So, one is the Biali, the other one is the Sharad and the other one is the Dalua. So, they were the different strains of rice. So, for example, uh, uh, Sarad was not uh, uh, I mean uh, during heavy floods or during heavy rains uh, there was a high chance that uh, Sarad uh, harvest would fail. So, that time it would get compensated by either Biali or Dalwa. So, this was the kind of an innovative strategy that they thought upon that we will keep our production choices diverse. So, that you know if there are seasonal variation in the flow uh, of the river then our agricultural uh, regime or our you know agricultural pattern would not get absolutely affected. So, this was one and uh, related to this was that there was also a, a flexible taxation arrangement uh, that was uh, that existed in the Orissa Delta because the uh, rulers and uh, the intermediaries they were also quite aware of the fluctuations uh, uh, in the uh, flow of the river. So, the also the fluctuation in river courses. So, during floods the farmers were not uh, supposed to uh, provide lot of revenue to the state, but then when uh, the flood water would recede and uh, then the, there would be silt on lands and then there would be good production and after that they would be charged with revenue. So, this was a flexible system that was maintained before the implementation of the permanent settlement, because we all know that how this flexibility absolutely got transformed into rigidity when permanent settlement was implemented in uh, you know Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. So, uh, so this diverse production choices and flexible taxation uh, uh, arrangements these were the two major pillars that helped the uh, farmers to continue with this you know uh, 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 with this uh, topography or with the seasonal pattern or seasonal flow of the river and hence Rohan de Souza says that Orissa during the pre-colonial time it was absolutely a kind of a flood dependent agrarian region, but not a flood vulnerable landscape which happened much later. So, even this is uh, from a colonizer's uh, account where he says that the Oriya cultivators whole system of cultivation has been adapted. So, they used to carry on adaptive practices to an uncertain and precarious rainfall. So, for the British it was very risky, British, Britishers were quite apprehensive and anxious of the system because uh, you know the pattern was very uncertain. So, there was a lot of uncertainty and risks involved in the whole affair. But they say that the cultivator he was he, he quite well adapted uh, to the system of uncertainty and risk. So, and also periodic inundation. He is a gambler, a very interesting term that uh, you know they use. So, he is a gambler, the farmer is a gambler because he knows how to adjust with uh, risks with uncertainty. So, he is a gambler, he has one field on the high ground, another in the hollow, another halfway between. So, that if he loses one crop by either flood or drought, he is pretty sure to save the other. So, see the kind of wisdom that is involved in our pre colonial system in uh, deltaic regions and scapes. Okay. So, uh, so, we uh, now know about Orissa. Now, if we uh, focus our uh, direction towards the west, we find that you know west was, so uh, it uh, Orissa was delta. So, the problem uh, of how to tackle uh, flood waters that was the main concern and in the arid and the semi arid region the uh, situation was uh, quite the reverse, because there was uh, in, in the in western India there was the question of scarcity of resource. So, how to go about or how to pursue judicious use of scarce resource uh, and how different interesting cultural ritualistic practices were uh, there were embedded in uh, for you know to pursue to continue or uh, to propagate judicious use of scarce resource. So, for example, uh, uh, if we um, you know if we uh, if we uh, learn about some of the folk traditional 
folk beliefs that are prevalent in uh, this region of uh, the West, then we will see that how this uh, series of folk beliefs, it emphasize, uh, still it emphasizes the value and sanctity of water. For example, I will uh, give one or two examples, uh, you know, uh, I mean again, uh, we do not have much, um, what to say, sophisticated scientific documentation on this, but we have to rely more on ethnography and oral narratives to know about the different cultural practices uh, that are prevalent in western India in the semi-arid and arid regions. And uh, there are few cultural practices which say, for example, uh, you know, uh, a daughter would have been scolded by a mother if uh, she wastes a tumbler of water, but she will not be scolded by her mother if she wastes a tumbler of milk. So, this is there in uh, the folk belief, I mean in the folk uh, literature. So, this is one. Secondly, like uh, it is said that if uh, a special guest arrives uh, at a household, then the special guest will only be offered a glass of water, but only one glass of water followed by glasses of milk. So, milk was not a problem, but water was a problem. So, they were very much uh, you know concerned about it, they were very much engaged into the judicious use of scarce resource which is water uh, in this particular context. So, there are very um, interesting other uh, you know cultural uh, practices uh, that we get to know from this uh, traditional folk beliefs, uh, folk songs, uh, folk literature, stories and all that. And for example, uh, uh, rain and water. Uh, are celebrated in Rajasthan's folk tradition like anything. So, no state in Rajasthan have uh, I mean sorry no state in India have so many uh, folk songs on clouds as Rajasthan has. Apart from that there is this Anga system and I would like to add here that this Anga system is uh, you know it is a kind of a beyond anthropocentric system because it is a system which was extremely important. Uh, which was extremely important for the egalitarian and equal distribution of water. So, anga it means a unit. So, how per unit of water was uh, uh, you know measured uh, for uh, each and every household. So, the first what uh, I mean the, uh, first the household structure uh, was mapped that how many people, how many um, animals uh, and you know how many other animate beings and then what amount of water would be allotted to that particular household. Then uh, you know um, in Gujarat we talked about the steppe wells uh, called the bhabs and uh, so when uh, the steppe well was excavated immediately after that uh, a deity uh, I mean there was a deity worship. So, the deity was offered with uh, uh, you know uh, with, with, with fruits and vegetables and other offerings because uh, the uh, cultural practice of deity worship and the technical uh, history of excavation of well are extremely interconnected. So, Vastu Pujan is another ritualistic uh, uh, affair uh, that is again connected with the excavation of uh, the step wells. So, and offerings to the deity that I had already mentioned. Yeah, so, uh, so First, we saw that like um, flood dependent agrarian regime. Secondly, we saw in the in the in the water flush regions like Orissa or the deltaic regions. Then we saw like judicious use of scarce water resource in the arid and semi-arid region. And now we should uh, look into another framework, which is the framework of ecological regeneration or vitality and participatory community framework that are very much associated with the uh, idea or the conceptualization of pre-colonial equilibrium. So, for example, Sanchi Hill is a celebration of water cosmology, Virdas, we talked about Virdas if you remember. So, Virdas it is again an integrated ecosystem functioning because uh, like uh, uh, vegetation is also grown uh, there and vegetation is very important for the infiltration of fresh water. So, we see how vegetation, forestry, water everything uh, you know are embedded. Uh, in the in the in the uh, construction excavation and functioning of these uh, water harvesting techniques so and apart from that you know all these involve collective community management this is also very important so this was this this is not top down the management or the ownership is not top down but it's participatory and it's bottom point yeah, sorry bottom up 
So, and uh, this uh, Vidas, it also had a lot of you know um, cultural and social meanings because these were also sometimes common meeting points where elders used to meet, they used to take rest under the shade of trees and all that. Uh, again, there are few sources um, so far as South India is concerned, it is called the Dasa Vandham irrigation sources. The Dasa Vandham irrigation sources, which talks about like how the cultivators were encouraged to construct. Uh, uh, tanks on rent free land or how you know uh, there would be exemption of land revenue if they were engaged into the construction and excavation of tanks. So, these are some of the social practices uh, that were performed with uh, this uh, you know which was closely connected to this water harvesting mechanism. And we also have near Granti that is the uh, uh, village servants. So, the village servants uh, were in charge of distribution of water from tanks. So, it is bottom up, it is participatory. So, these are some of the arguments that are made to validate the framework of pre colonial equilibrium. Yeah. Now, we will critically interrogate uh, whatever we have learnt and discussed till now. So, new interesting researches are uh, coming up in the uh, water history uh, sector, where uh, historians uh, they are not only using you know field research, but they are also uh, using extensive ethnography and anthropological approach to understand like uh, what are the existing realities or even what were the existing realities in different parts of India uh, during the ancient time. So, whether the ancient water management or water harvesting system was absolutely holistic or not, this is the crucial question or the grand question that uh, needs critical interrogation. So, like for example, I will give the example of Ian Stone who uh, wrote on the uh, north India and more important northwest frontier province critiquing and criticizing the uh, uh, discourse uh, put forward by Elizabeth Whitcomb. Because Elizabeth Whitcomb showed that how uh, you know water management in northwestern India during the pre-colonial times more specifically during the medieval times were um, I mean uh, extremely important for the uh, agricultural productivity for increasing the agricultural productivity in that region, but how that was absolutely replaced by the uh, by colonial hydrology. But stone shows that how canals in the northwest became a source of economic dynamism and constant innovation. So, stone's argument is not uh, as linear as Elizabeth Whitcomb. So, definitely we can debate on this. Because Elizabeth Whitcomb, when he, uh, when she wrote in 1972, uh, which we'll discuss again when we'll uh, discuss in detail colonial hydrology. But then, when Elizabeth Whitcomb uh, published in 1972, she, to a great extent, looked into looked into all the very important economic statistics for the different for I think 40 districts uh, within that very range of Northwest Frontier Province. So, we can definitely challenge Stone's argument as well, but then Stone also uses empirical you know data and findings to show that Northwest uh, how you know the canal system uh, uh, introduced by the British became a source of dynamism and innovation for the farmers. So, uh, so far as South is concerned then uh, there is recent research by Peter uh, Schmithener and he, he writes that hydraulic engineering projects in the deltas of Kaveri and Godavari rivers were less environmentally disruptive or destructive. So, this is an argument that again challenges the uh, arguments put forward by many other historians uh, focusing on South India. So, he says that this system was less environmentally disruptive than colonial riparian works of north. So, he compares, he uses a comparative uh, framework. Uh, comparing North India with South India and says that the colonial you know uh, the, the hydrology framework for South India was little, uh, was less disruptive and destructive than uh, North India. And he says that uh, here in South India it blended more into the environmental and cultural landscape of the respective delta rivers. So, this is the alternative argument that uh, Schmidt Henner uh, talks about. Then coming to Hardiman. So, Hardiman says that Hardiman talks about the west, west. So, we uh, I mean we have covered uh, northwest, 
we had talked about south and now we are talking about west. So, Hardiman he says that commercialization and peasant indebtedness were processes that predated colonial region. So, there is nothing to you know uh, romanticize or utopianize the pre colonial period. So, because peasant indebtedness, so I remember like Shelley's uh, you know oft quoted statement that like uh, that the peasants, the farmers, they, uh, they, they are bo they born in debt, they live in debt and they die in debt. So, this, this the peasant indebtedness or the farmer indebtedness is a universal uh, phenomena across historical scales. So, he says that it predates uh, the colonial regime and uh, th uh, these uh, characteristics that is commercialization and peasant indebtedness were integral to the expansion of well irrigation in the west. So, it had nothing to do really with the colonial um, period. Uh, though you know uh, he does not deny that the colonial period was also a disaster for uh, the indebtedness and commercialization, but he says what he says is that it uh, already began the processes began before the onset of the colonial rule. Yeah. So, again uh, focusing on western India like Hardiman, uh, Ati Rosin. Ati Rosin talks about the coexistence of modern with pre colonial techniques in West India. So, he says that it is not the theory of re replacement, but it is the idea of coexistence. So, the uh, so both the system the colonial and the pre colonial coexisted with each other. So, the pre colonial was not replaced by the colonial hydraulic techniques, but rather in Western India in uh, this uh, both the systems it had a parallel coexistence. Moss, Moss had done lot of work on uh, South India, especially focusing on uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Shiva Ganga and Ramnath districts, which are very famous for extensive tank irrigation system. And Moss writes that village communities were unstable entities. Talking about the pre-colonial period, he says that village communities were unstable entities, driven and shaped by hierarchies. So that's the key word, hierarchies. So, casteism was again embedded in the system. So, if you take a look into the you know entire process of uh, excavation of tanks, you will find lot of caste hierarchy in it, labor exploitation, caste hierarchy. And finally, uh, as I was talking about uh, Isha Shah, so, uh, so Isha Shah, uh, she had written two very interesting articles and the names of the articles are also very fascinating. So, the names itself, uh, the names themselves indicate that she is really uh, coming up with some alternative uh, narratives and uh, histories. So, one article uh, 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 is I mean the title of one particular paper is uh, seeing like a subaltern. So, you understand that uh, so herself how she is applying ethnography uh, or the ethnographic approach and how she is uh, um, seeing the whole thing the larger picture as a subaltern and trying to understand uh, the entire affair from the perception and perspective of a subaltern. So, one is this seeing like a subaltern and the other uh, paper is called telling otherwise, again a very interesting name telling otherwise. So, what we know now might not be the entire ground reality. So, it is important to tell otherwise to know the you know other stories that are there, but which were often uh, which had often remained neglected and ignored till now because our I mean the methodologies that we had applied might be not that sophisticated right. So, she tries to capture the micro realities again in South India uh, focusing on Karnataka mainly and she um, I mean she she had consulted the folk songs and stories. So, as I mentioned it is uh, an ethnographic methodology that she had used. Uh, so, she had consulted folk songs and uh, stories inscribed in popular memory. So, from oral narratives. So, which bear testimony this is very important bear testimony to what to hydrological irregularity, technological vulnerability and social anxiety. So, she slashes you know um, this framework of pre colonial equilibrium versus colonial hydrology by saying that no particular regime you know can be uh, extremely beneficial for uh, subalterns like any people you know situated at the lower rungs of the society be it uh, be it gender, be it caste, be it class, be it race, be it re ethnicity whatever. So, these are the alternative ideas that uh, are coming up today and enriching 
the field of environmental history and more important uh, water history and provoking us not only to think in linear terms to uh, know the you know water harvest to know the uh, wisdom uh, that was there in ancient India so far as water harvesting or water use technologies are concerned, but at the same time also uh, not get carried away or not to uh, you know romanticize or utopianize uh, those things by saying that everything was uh, extremely you know beautiful and everything was uh, what to say uh, rosy. So, so, this is the framework uh, which I have tried to conceptualize as beyond uh, reduction is dualism. So, again finally, I would conclude by saying that uh, I mean uh, it is not um, compulsory for us to either take Rohan de Souza's uh, viewpoint or you know uh, get convinced by Ishasha's viewpoint, but we must uh, say that you know there are micro realities so far as regional specificities are concerned. So, it is important for us to take into consideration the micro picture to know about the macro framework, but also in a in great details in minute details also to capture the micro ground realities that are uh, ex that existed or that are still prevalent across uh, you know particular regional uh, and uh, particular regional sites uh, of India. So, what is important for us is to deploy the uh, methodology of the which what is known as you know epistemology of particulates in uh, social sciences. So, it is important uh, from the very beginning to you know uh, be little conscious and aware uh, of the scientific validation of the you know empirical findings or empirical understanding that we try to gather. So, these are uh, some of the important references or works that I could cover and in the next lecture we will be discussing the you know uh, colonial period and overtly focusing on the framework of colonial hydrology. Thank you.